you're referred to in a lot of different ways. Sometimes mm. it's as a graphic designer, sometimes it's kind of, you know, an art director, a creative mm. director, sometimes it's just simply as an artist. I'm interested, what do you think you do? In some ways, it's probably fabulous to, to, to not be fixed somewhere, to not be contained, you know, in some kind of, of box. The downside of it is that as you know, we live in an era of increasing specialization with so many people around doing things and everybody being very specific and everybody having a very kind of focused brand about who they are and where they do it and how they do it. And in a way, the kind of the, the leveraging of remuneration for being absolutely the person to, mm. you know, photograph bananas. Um, uh, then I, I'm handicapped um, professionally, I'm handicapped financially by not being definitively one person or one type of person or another. But I was thinking a lot when I was researching about that idea of communication and about sort of the very nature of graphic design tends to be that you have to have something to communicate. Yes. Whereas actually a record sleeve you don't necessarily. N somebody Can't. does. Somebody does, but in a sense, you know, when someone goes to buy a record, they already know they want it. They perhaps already oh, know absolutely. the Absolutely. They don't need to be told to buy it at all. When people want a record, they want a record. It really, the famous brown paper bag, it really doesn't matter. Occasionally, you will buy a record that, mm. you, that you didn't know you wanted because of the cover. You've never not bought a record you wanted because of the cover. So, so you, sometimes, you know, there's something that we want. Um, and we're elated to say, wow, it looks great as well. Yeah. And sometimes we're disappointed and think, oh, cranky, that's... I don't really... <laughs> but, but it doesn't stop you buying it. So, yeah. so, so therefore, the record cover has no function yeah. other than to protect the record. It has no function. So in that sense, it is Packaging. not unlike an art yeah. medium. It, has no, it actually has no specific function. And if you have no requirement of conveying information either... Mm then you have a relatively free-form pseudo-art object for young people. The phenomenon of the record cover is kind of, it's, it's neatly encapsulated, painfully but neatly encapsulated by something that Tony Wilson would always maintain, that pop was the art of the playground. It kind of upset me because I was trying to get away from the playground as a young adult and it seemed to... Um, intellectually in a way devalue the 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 culture of pop to think of it to frame it in in that way some years later now i i can look much more sort of fav favorably on that point of view in that by being the art of the playground in this post-war period of whatever that is now 60 70 years um Pop has been the generic given culture to all young people in, 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 the, in the Western world, given and shared universally by them. Mm -hmm. So ever since my teens in, gosh, remember that, the 60s, I have been sharing in a common culture of pop with all the other people of my own age and then with younger people. Um, and that, of course, that has become just increasingly prevalent yeah. over, you know, the 50 years from the 60s until now. Um, so there's this common grounding, a kind of foundation course in shared popular culture that, that we all have to some degree or another. And particularly in the UK, because the UK is this tiny test case project space of pop. Mm. Um, pop culture is intense in this country. The, we have a very large number of people in a relatively very small space, all sharing, all on the same time zone for most of the 60s, the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, sharing like one, one or two TV channels yeah. and one or two radio channels, a really shared experience. Um, and also in the first language of pop, which is English. 
If something is happening in a playground in Manchester today, then Glasgow and London know about it by the end of the day. I would, even when I was growing up about it, they knew it within it in days. Now, I mean, now it's instantaneous. Yeah. So, so therefore you have this shared experience and that, it's actually that that has, has had bearing on what happened to me in that my work reached through a kind of, in, through the sort of marginal channels of, of pop culture, it reached a very wide range of, of people unexpectedly um, who were still all in their formative yeah. teens. And then they went on to become doctors, accountants, bus drivers, artists, photographers, fashion designers, architects, um, entrepreneurs, business people, um, homeless people, across the board, mm. um, teachers, educators, I made a certain impression or the work that I was able to do through the autonomy of factory allowed me to make this impression upon people, um, which has had some bearing on, on their own standards, values and, and how they see the world. Yeah, because there's an amazing quote which you gave in a past interview where you said, I'm really not that interested in doing graphic design. It's the context and the meaning of the work that appeals to me. And the person interviewing you said, where has this led you to? And you said, unemployable. Yes, well, but yeah, I mean, I, yeah, people do refer to me as unemployable. I perhaps should have been a fashion designer. I perhaps should have had one artist. I perhaps should have been in a discipline that afforded me my own, um, my own initiative. The formal career of the communication designer is to deliver the messages that you are asked to deliver. Now, this is what kills most young people who go into communications design. They go to work in a studio and it's a job and they have to do the job. So they find themselves, you know, being asked to do sandwich wrappers for boots. They ask themselves, to, they ask themselves being found to, to, to um, find a way to put some extra info on a Sky Broadband, you know, kind of um, web page or something. And it's just, they find themselves just ground down by the awful banality of 99% of communications work. I mean, our entire globe is a communications sphere and most of it is either awful in its intent or just aesthetically awful. I mean, there's a few things that look beautiful, but actually when we, when we say, what is this for? We go, oh no, not that. <laughs> or, and there's a lot of stuff which just still looks terrible. Mm. Um, and I mean, this, used, this pained me enormously as a young person. That I, I would look out at the world we were in and I knew how things could be done and I saw how they were done. And this, this, this actually I, I found really, really painful and really upsetting. Growing up in, 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 in you know, uh, uh, an industrial, about to become post-industrial city in the north of England in the 60s and early 70s, uh, uh, contemporary art was something that definitely was going on somewhere in the world, perhaps in New York, yeah. and kind of appeared occasionally in my life in a book or a... Um, you know, the uh, Sunday magazines, which had just kind of started then in the 60s. But it, there, was, there, was, there was no art reality in, in the world that I knew. So the idea of going to art college to do art was, to me, in a kind of middle-class business family value way, to me was unimaginable. It seems like something that does engage you is the notion of putting art into people's lives, regardless of yes. whether they're a collector. You know, there are some very critical things that happen in the 70s, in, in my opinion. The, the blueprint of the now is without a doubt in the 70s. Um, the, first, um, the first concert that I went to um, was in 1969, and I was 14, and I went to a Blind Faith concert in Manchester. And Blind Faith were one of the first 
super groups, the first group formed by people who had kind of in a way made a name for themselves in other groups. Um, but I didn't go to see Blind Faith, I went to see the person who was supporting Blind Faith. And he was, a, he, he was a guy who had a single in the charts called Space Odyssey. So I went to see David Bowie supporting Blind Faith. So I, so I went to see David Bowie. As a 14-year-old, I went to see David Bowie. Now, David Bowie is, you know, without a doubt, the first really significant formative influence upon me and many people of my generation. David, David, David Bowie suggested, and certainly, you know, post Space Oddity and when he kind of comes back as Ziggy. Creating by, an image. Yeah, by which time I am, let's say, 72, I am 17. David Bowie puts to these younger teenagers the notion that you might be able to be something yourself, that you might actually be able to create mm an identity for yourself. Now, this was a very relative, relatively a very new idea for ordinary young people in ordinary parts of, 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 of Britain. It was perhaps not exciting or not, not revelatory at all to, to privileged children from artistic families or wealth families or whatever, but to ordinary kids in ordinary like homes at ordinary schools, the idea that you might actually create an identity for yourself that isn't given, that I'm not the world's most virtuoso rock player, so therefore I will be a rock god, I, I am not a great filmmaker, so I, that actually you could just invent something for yourself, that you could actually go to the vintage clothes shop or to the makeup mm. or to the... <laughs> makeup table in your in your mum's bedroom or whatever and actually invent an image but and you... this well this was like a major lesson from like kind of professor bowery the idea that you might have somebody in you other than who your parents were is a quite modern contemporary idea um when i was growing up people still did for the most part, what was expected of them. And, you know, they had a bit of a kind of, you know, rebellious time in their teens, and then they got their hair cut, bought a suit, you know, married a man, whatever, and, and, and basically repeated in some way the life that their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents had had before. Maybe just moving along a little bit to a bigger house, a better job or something, a motor car. It was all very on rails. Life was on rails. So the idea that you might be somebody other than who your parents were was actually still a kind of breaking kind of idea in ordinary homes, you know, 40 and 50 years ago. That, that, that there might be something to invent, that you might be gay. I mean, like, nobody wanted to countenance that, that you might want to go and live in a foreign country. This was a strange thing to do. You know, my mother wasn't happy when I just went as far as London. Um, so the, 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 the notion of finding who we are and doing things that are diff were really different to how we grew up, that is something we totally take for granted now. We are able to come a very, very long way now compared to previous decades. So this notion, and this was the, the inspiration, the motivation for, for this, has been delivered in this country by pop, without a doubt. It was not school, it was not family, it was not state that, that said to me, actually, the horizons are where you want them to be. They didn't say that to me at all. It was actually David Bowie who said to me, you know, you could go anywhere. And, and that was a really, and I think that there are thousands of, of other people of my generation who actually consciously or subconsciously picked up that same message. We've talked before where you've said that, you know, you were drawing on things 
when you put together, like, let's say Blue Monday, for example, but you said, you know, Marinetti would have liked Blue Monday, but you say the yeah. way people collage or reference or quote your work, you don't necessarily like it. You feel like it's been devalued. It's really a matter of context. I mean, um, in 1983, when I saw a painting, an oil painting of a bunch of, of roses by Fantano Tour, I'd gone to the National Gallery looking for something completely different and picked up a postcard of, 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 of roses. I was looking for a solution to something called Power, Corruption and Lies by New Order. And that, the, 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 that there was an unexpected enigmatic synergy there. And I had complete freedom to put Fantan Latour's roses on the cover of Power, Corruption and Lies. And, and I felt in that moment that there was a pertinence to a certain romanticism that had been denigrated by the term chintz, mm. there was a certain pertinence and romanticism that could be in the now. Now, there was a fashion parallel. Georgina Godley and Scott Crowler had a shop called Crowler on Dover Street, and Georgina was, was running up dresses from Sanderson's upholstery fabrics. So Georgina was already going out, finding chintz fabrics that should really have been in Country Life magazine and making summer frocks out of them. This, so we were picking up on a kind of neo-60s yeah. hate ashbury flower power thing, but ironically using chintzy pseudo-romanticism as, as the kind of visual analogy. Partly because it was ironically cool to put a 19th century oil painting of roses on a New Order album called Power, Corruption and Lies was, of course, you know, frightfully ironic. <laughs> but also buried within that was the fact that I, li I liked the painting. But you say you didn't know it when you went there and you saw it, you kind of came across it haphazardly. Yeah. How is that different, which I know pisses you off because you talked about it in interviews before, how is that different to a kid finding a Joy Division cover on Tumblr, posting it without knowing what it is? My only... Um, discomfort is when things are used inappropriately. So I, in everything that I've appropriated, I felt at the time that uh, some rationale, some reason, and yeah. also some respect. Um, you know, I, I, I put, a, a, I put a, or what we could have almost called a remix of a futurist poster by Fortunato de Pero, I put that on New Order's first album, Movement. Um, but in doing so, I kind of, I had to say to myself, how would the futurists feel about this? How, how would Marinetti feel about New Order? And I kind of thought, in 1981, Marinetti would really like New Order. The, 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 this, experiment of driving forward with technology in music, a kind of relentless, you know, kind of thrust into the future would be, I mean, New Order would definitely have been one of the futurists, you know, kind of favoured groups at that time. Now, I get a bit frustrated, as we all do, when uh, very young people just move everything around without knowing where anything fits. Now, sometimes we can, uh, we can um, forgive them for that. Other times we can think, actually, that's really fucking lazy. You know, you should just, you know, think a little bit mm. before you pick something up in one place and put it down in another. Maybe it's not laziness. Maybe it's kind of that, just that um, natural ignorance, which kind well, of yes, is but just age. At what point do we, can we, do we stop forgiving natural ignorance at five or like 50, it's, you know? It's, easy I mean, to make, it's easier to make good work when you're ignorant. There's, it's easier to make good work when you don't know what you're doing, but of okay. course there are some, without a doubt, you do, I mean, things that I did when I was in my 20s, I wouldn't do now, and I, I know that I'm too straight-jacketed by, by concern to have that freedom now. Um, so is it, did you find it easier to make good work when you were... Well, it's a matter of what you call good work. It's easier to make free work when you... The less you know, the less you're impeded. Now what's good and what's influential are different things. You know, I probably would make better work now, but it might be less influential because of the context. So that freedom, that freedom um, can 
constitutes as something being very Im influential. It's not necessarily good. Um, but so it, might be, it so? might be important. Things can be important and not good. You know, God save the queen. Is it good or is it important? It's definitely important and it's definitely influential. Is it good? Debatable. The thing that most upsets me is when my work or in some model of my work, the cultural canon is appropriated for unsuitable um, intent or to an in unsuitable intent. What's un unsuitable well, you know, to, to you? So, so to kind of sell text packages, to, to use, um, to use the codes of culture to legitimize banality. So the, the, the blatant pursuit of, of, of profit, the unnecessary, the untruthful, the, um, um, the disrespectful, the disturbing. I mean, we see constantly now in commercial communications. Now, everybody that I speak to in the creative communications world says to me that it's just getting more and more and more like that. Which makes me very relieved that for the last 10 or 15 years, I have been outside of that world, not running a studio, not employing people, not having an agency of some sort, and therefore not kind of harnessed by this kind of um, uh, so-called creative work. Um, but is it hard doing that? Because in a way you forfeit a lot of things. You yes, forfeit recognition forfeit lots of and things. money. And yeah. Exactly, exactly. I thought, I thought, you know, I don't actually, I mean, I, I, you know, I live in my studio and I don't own it. And, and not owning where you live in London these days is, is, is not comfortable. So, you know, I'll, I will be 60 this year. And I'm, in that sense, I'm like 60 going on 16. I have great sympathy with everybody under 40 in London who doesn't own a place either. It's a, it's a real horror show. I mean, it's really, really terrifying, truly terrifying. Um, and, and I have great sympathy for that because I am also in my version of, of that uncertainty and fear. Do you think that the influence of your work hasn't been properly kind of recognised, whether that's financially or whatever? Uh, there is enormous recognition from some, in some quarters. Yeah. Okay. So it, it would be, you know, kind of blind of me. It, it would be ungrateful of me to not, uh, to not acknowledge that. And some of that recognition is quite formal and inst institutional. Uh, and some of it is entirely casual. So, you know, I can still walk down the street and, and somebody will, you know, say something nice, which is great. They're kind of impromptu moments, yeah. um, which can often get you through the rest of the day or even the whole week. Um, so, so there is that recognition. Um, exactly what label to apply, exactly where we started this is kind of difficult. Uh, that's often a bit of a challenge. Um, and in truth, really, the only, the only, the only form of further recognition that I would quite like um, would would kind of be somewhere to live. Actually, yes, would be would <laughs> would be would be a Peter Savile institution where where I could sort of live until That's I die. Hard. That would be like just where. where the, Somewhere that I could call, if there was like a Peter Savile Museum that I could call home whilst I was still alive, uh, that would be kind of convenient. Uh, that, would, that, would, that would take an awful lot of uh, anxiety and, and stress off me at, at this late stage in my life. That would be really nice. Uh, I would like to sleep in my own museum. Uh, it could become a mausoleum. Museum, then mausoleum. That would be brilliant. Um, the... The, the, the bigger recognition uh, or deeper recognition, um, that tends to come in retrospect. And because of the kind of the, the, the diversity of the work, you know, I mean, how can anybody um, other than myself know where things have gone? And I, even I 
forget and don't and also don't realize i'm still surprised by people who come to me and said oh by the way i did this because of that i went wow really i would never have imagined that um so there's um there's a kind of there's probably a bigger landscape a kind of a picture of things that that the opportunity that i had influenced there's probably a a reasonably you know an unknown map and it still happens you know i still you know even unknown pleasures you know the first album cover still comes back in in unexpected ways from you know almost every week so the first the first work that i put together in 1979 that still comes round like a comet or orbiting almost every week unknown pleasures comes back in another form or another the flowers the the phantom the tour the the, the <laughs> that one's been coming back again and again and again in in recent years i mean pr obviously predominantly in in fashion the the influence of 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 the phantom the tour you know a basket of roses you know has been has been reverberating around quite powerfully the last few years um why because actually, well, this is quite because because actually, um, we like those things. the 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 funny thing about me putting chintz on a new order cover was that it kind of legitimised it. It was okay. It made it cool. It made it cool to say, I I I, I like that flower painting. <laughs> it made flower painting groovy. Um, that's what it did. There are certain contexts where we can place things. I mean, this is like totally, you know, f fashion practice. You can pick something up from one place, and and it's kind of it's curation, and and it, it's the 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 the, the credibility, legit, the legitimacy that 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 certain curation or curatorial context. Um, um, uh, endows upon something. But you've kind of then legitimised the very practice then, haven't you? Because you're putting something on something to legitimise it. So in a sense, that's kind of opening the door for fashion people to whack your stuff on a t-shirt or on the back yeah, of a jacket. which they do. I think people have definite ideas about your, what your work is about. But mm. is it expressive? Like, who are you, basically? Oh, who am I? Mm. Thank you. Um... The, 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 the thing that I am, or the being that I am, is one that's uh, probably a little bit overactive in some ways. Very, very, I mean, some people love that. It's like, I, spend, I used to spend half the day in bed, but I would you know, be sort of lazily overactive. Um, overactive in the sense of looking at a lot of different things all of the time being diversely interested in things so from you know from from science to fashion to to politics and then as you know as you get older that range of things that you're interested in still continues but also i but i maintain an interest in some of the earlier ones as well um so i'm interested in a lot of different things and look at a lot of different things but that's not you that's what you're no interested that's in. what i do but then then what i do is is I see the connections between things. Um, and I see parallels between things. And, um, and that's not my work. That's just me. Um, I, I like reading. Um, I like reading the, the visual world. I'm like uh, born in, in a moment of interesting transition. So I was like born in 55, which is usually kind of quoted as like the first year of pop. It's the kind of beginning. So I'm some kind of pop human. Um, with pop being in social history like a phenomenon the post-war period the dissemination of opportunity to many the notion of popular culture being a thing the thing well that's was entirely an entirely new moment in in human history 
that what something for everybody something for everybody being the most important thing wow that was a, a new idea um i'm born in that time and, and shaped by in a way the last phase of analog history the last phase of the logical progression of things, of understanding the world as a logical sequence of events. So even they may be Ill illogical moments, they still fall in a logical sequence. The Second World War follows on from the first because of the Treaty of Versailles. I mean, basically, you know, awfully illogical um, happenings, but when we stem back from them, there was a kind of a logic to how they happened. And, and people of my generation and older um, are kind of hardwired to forms of logic. We actually look for solutions in things. We look for logic. We look for understandings of the world. The digital over the last sort of 20 years has really fractured and kind of become atomized. So our experience of things and our relationship to things is kind of atomized. The, the kind of previous almost pedantic way of things seems really kind of archaic now. That, that B would have to follow A and then C and D, and that, that there would be this kind of logical sequence of things. The, 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 the era that I grew up in of isms, of uh, you know, a romanticism or classicism or vorticism, the, the kind of isms of, 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 of culture leading up to my time and the kind of mini phases of fashion that were kind of self-contained um, have given way to a kind of a pluralism. So in our, in fashion and culture now, it's pluralist. I mean, there isn't a singular prevailing school at any time. I mean, fashion, not at all. I mean, it would be commercial suicide to, 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 to base a collection on any particular singular frame. Um, so our cultural experience has become entirely pluralist. I try to understand the, the, the now, my now. And of course that changes through your life. So, you know, you're 15 years of age in this place and you try to understand that. And then you're like 50 in another place and you try to understand that. And, and I try to understand the now it, it, it infuriates me. I mean, it makes me really angry, the things that I see going on, the socio-political, the socio-economic things that I see going on, that, that as you get older, it gets really, really, really very upsetting, very upsetting, understanding, beginning to see what goes on in this world that you live in, is really brutal and cruel So how do you hideous. keep going then? How? How do you keep going then? Well, you, you keep going because you don't have any choice until you die. That's unfortunately the problem. We, you have to keep going. Now, you can't even stand still in London at this time without paying for it. Okay, so you have to keep going until you die. Dying is the only moment that you can afford to not keep going. It's like sharks, you know, apparently they have to keep moving. We have to keep moving. If we stop moving, if we, well, actually, if we stop moving, we don't have the comfort of death. We just have the problems of homelessness, bankruptcy, insolvency, being like on the street. Are you scared about the future? Well, I would be really scared if I had children. If I had so children, I would be really concerned for them, really concerned, but I don't have any children. So I'm scared about my own future but I'm not scared about the future beyond me. I am, I, am, I am terrified of the next five or 10 years, of my own five or 10 years, and deeply unsettled by it. 
you know, I have an income at this time whilst I keep working, but only enough of an income to slightly stay, keep my head above water in, in, in London. I, as yet, I have nothing to fall back on. And, you know, I'm getting older and more tired and less inclined to, to you know, to, to, to do ridiculous, banal work for people that comes up the kind of things that you get paid for. And, um, you know, in that sense, I'm, you know, like I said earlier, 60 going on 16. And I don't really want to be 16 at 60. I'm not fit enough. Um, I don't like the, the, the way the world has gone, particularly over the last 20 years, particularly since, you know, I, 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 dis I found out what a recession was first time round in 1990. That was enlightening and educational to me. I can't, you know, I still cannot fathom what happened since the last recession, what happened between 95 and now 2015, what was allowed to happen in our society astonishes me. It, 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 it's morally bankrupt what has been allowed to happen. The, 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 um, the dereliction of duty by governance over that period is, is, is almost total. The, 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 the society of, 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 of Great Britain has, is pretty much like thrown to the wolves, as it, has, as it you, is being in other countries. How do you stay creative if you don't feel optimistic? Um, to pay the rent. <laughs>